So um, I think she's here. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> again, good, good, good to have you here. We have Joan and um, Mary. I don't know which one of you are leading the prayer this um, as we begin. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, yep. I'll be leading Joan. the prayer tonight, and then uh, Mary and I will be doing the official, the officiant, and the response for our compliment. Thanks, Joan. So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we gather tonight, help us put aside the concerns of the day and be present to one another. May we listen with the ear of our heart to what you might be saying to us. And may we come away from this gathering more committed to each other and to you. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Christine, are you ready? I am, yeah. <laughs> I'd be curious if everybody had had their microphones on, Jan, when you first mentioned that we're going to touch the topic of humility, if there was a wave of groans. Oh, no, not humility. Humility doesn't have the most popular uh, uh, rep reputation, I know, in a lot of spirituality circles, but hopefully we can uh, uh, compensate for a little bit of that in our conversation tonight. Um, I do want to actually start tonight by offering a note of gratitude to Bishop Loya and to you, Pastor Jan, for your teachings in the previous weeks. Um, I had the chance to uh, engage in both of those and was really glad that you laid good foundations um, for this maybe a little bit deeper dive that we're going to do today in the sense that we're just going to look at one specific aspect of the, of the rule. Um, but, you know, those three pillars of prayer and community and service that uh, Bishop Loya spoke about really are, um, I think, in, uh, an app name, naming of the framework of, of Benedictine life. And those vows, of course, are really important. You know, if you're going to take this, this commitment on or if you're going to uh, engage in this way, then it's good to know uh, what it is that one is committing to. And so stability, conversatio morum, and obedience. Um, thanks for tapping into those too, Jen. Um, so it's lovely to be here. Um, one of the things that I like to say is that I really think that Benedict's vision and his way of life has made it through all of these centuries, 1500 years later, uh, in large part because it's focused on the ordinary. Um, it's focused on practical and concrete ways of being. Um, and very specifically, Benedict was really holistic in his perspective on things. One of the things that I'm really grateful for and that we're picking up on in this series is that Benedict was both attentive to the community's needs, but also to the individual's needs. So we see a structure for a way of life, but a lot of attention and the nuances and the details that Benedict includes in his rule about how the leader of the community should be um, dealing with all the folks and all their particularity. And so I'm really grateful that Benedict gives us that model of, of wholeness and looking both at the personal journey as well as the communal journey. I will say too, um, uh, when Jan and I connected years ago, I was at St. Ben's working as an employee, but I actually was a student first at St. Ben's in my late teens and early 20s. So my own heart and soul have definitely been shaped by the Benedictine way of life. Um, you know, I started to pray a lot with the sisters when I came to student as a campus uh, and then later working. And I eventually did become an oblate uh, with the community here in St. Joe. And as Jan mentioned, a bunch of you might know that the Episcopal House of Prayer is located over on the other Benedictine campus, uh, over with the guys at the monastery at the Abbey. And so um, here at the House of Prayer, we're literally saturated with kind of the, the Benedictinism in the air and in the um, stream. Uh, so one of the things that I want to say specifically about uh, humility as um, we're going to propose it kind of as the personal pathway in Benedictine's, uh, Benedict's teaching. Um, it's one of the longest sections of the rule. Interestingly, um, it starts in chapter seven and goes on for chapter uh, for paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. And so um, some of you may have seen, you know, shorter little uh, summaries like Bishop Loya mentioned. There's lots of ways to kind of digest and pull out bits of Benedictine um, spirit. Uh, some of the common ones here on our campuses are the Benedictine values, awareness of God, moderation, dignity of work, truthful living, justice, just these values that can be extrapolated 
But humility is one of the threads that's explicitly written in and extensively uh, written about in directly in the text of the rule. And like I said, um, I think it serves as a map of the pathway towards Benedict's vision of spiritual maturity and also communal transformation. Um, so the basic way that Benedict introduces the topic of humility is to talk about the image of Jacob's ladder. Some of you might be familiar with that text um, in which there's a bit of a paradox that as we ascend and descend uh, Jacob's ladder, we actually become greater when we descend and we become less when we ascend. And so there's this interesting paradox um, that Benedict presents to us right at the beginning of of this um, metaphor. And I think it's really wise to note that this isn't a one way linear trajectory. We don't only go up and never go back. The idea that we're constantly going up and down the ladder, I think, speaks to the reality of what it's like to be committed to a pathway of spiritual maturity and transformation. Um, and so on this ladder, there are actually 12 rungs. And unfortunately, because we only have about 20 minutes of teaching time tonight, we won't go into each of the rungs with a lot of depth. Um, but what I would like to do today is to focus on what I think are pretty easily discernible sets, three sets of relationships that, in, that Benedict invites us to focus on through the 12 steps. And so those sets of relationships are, first of all, a relationship with God that we'll see in steps one and two, our relationship with ourself that we'll see um, as we relate uh, uh, as, with ourself, and then thirdly, our relationship with others. So God, self, and others, lots of relationships here. Um, and uh, before we dive into the three sets, I want to just first of all uh, mention the word humility. Like I said, it sometimes gets a bad rap in spiritual circles. I'm going to ask just a brief survey by raise of hand. How many of you would say you're humble? There's even a little bit of a, a, a smile on my face as I say that, because of course, in our typical ways of thinking about humility, we don't say, yes, I'm humble, I'm humble, here's my hand, of course I'm saying I'm humble, because we often think of humility as belittling oneself or diminishing oneself, rather than sort of living fully into what one is. Um, and so I'm glad if you, if you do think about yourself as humble. Um, one of the things that we know about the word humility is that it's really closely related etymologically to the word humus or humus. And we know that humus is earthy. It's the stuff of the earth. And so again, when we talk about humility, we're not talking about lowliness in the sense of degrading ourselves. We're talking about loneliness, lowliness in the sense of being grounded, of being simple, simply showing up in the space that you're in. Um, so it's not about humility and degradation or becoming small, but more about arriving in the moment that you're in, putting your feet firmly on that humus, on that ground, and being grounded in the space. Um, Joan Chittister is a well-known Benedictine sister who offers a definition of um, humility. She says the, the humility is the ability to know ourselves as God knows us. And so in that sense, when we think about offering God's perspective about who we were created to be and what we're called to become, by no means do we want to put a light over that bushel, right? The idea of humility here is to step into the fullness of what it is that God has created us to be and who God calls us to become. Um, my own definition of uh, uh, humility, and this is part of what I use when I teach my undergraduate students here at St. Ben's, and pulling in some of my other traps of discernment, et cetera, but is then related to that really practically. Humility is a process of discerning one's true and full identity as both made in the image of God, no more and no less, and also in relationship to God himself and others. And so you'll see it's pretty easy for me to extrapolate these three sets of relationships in this ladder of humility. I want to make one quick comment about the temptation of false humility. Um, it's important to talk about if humility is about admitting your giftedness before God and because of God um, and acknowledging that all the gifts that we have and the createdness that we are are given to us by God. Um, then there's a way in which we can sometimes twist humility by either over focusing or under focusing on ourselves. 
sometimes we think that pride is only an overemphasis, like the egotistical person is full of pride, right? We think of somebody who's full of it or full of themselves <laughs> is the prideful person. But interestingly, there are actually two faces of pride. Um, and both of them result in an overemphasis on ourselves. So to the degree that we exaggerate our ability and we make ourselves bigger than we actually really are, then we might look at one face of pride that's overemphasizing ourselves in the typical ways that I think we think about boastfulness, et cetera. But we can also exaggerate our inadequacy. And that's actually another form of false humility, um, kind of contrary to that notion of purposely belittling ourselves. When we exaggerate our inadequacy, we similarly overfocus on ourselves and we don't recognize the fullness of the gift that we are because of God's having created us. So I invite us to hold both of those kind of poles of overemphasis on self, both exaggeration of ability, but also exaggeration of inadequacy as two of the tricky faces of, of, of pride. And of course, um, they then are uh, the foundations of what we might call a false humility. Okay, so to go back to these three sets of relationships, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, oops, looks like I'm not able to. Um, Jan, are you, who is our uh, facilitator for today? Is anybody either able to allow me to share a screen or uh, maybe has the handout that I sent earlier in the day available? If try not, it I might now. Try it now? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So what I'm going to share here is um, a handout of Benedict's rule uh, as humility is presented. And if you give me a second, I'll get to the top here. Um, I'm just going to make general references to this. So we're not going to, like I said, have time to go through all the details here. I'm going to make it nice and big so everybody can see it. Um, but what I'm going to suggest is that there's sort of three sets of relationships that we can look at when we're thinking about our own pathways of personal transformation within this large, larger guidance. And so rung one, uh, what I've got here is three different ways of talking about what's going on here. The modern one is my own um, translation or my own modern contemporary reading of each of these. Benedict, um, this comes directly from the rule. And then the third is Joan Chittister's ways of talking about each of these rungs of the ladder. And what I'd like to propose is that rung one and rung two are invitations for us to focus on our relationship with God. Rungs three through eight, I believe, are going to be invitations for us to focus on our relationship with uh, ourselves. And then finally, um, rungs eight through 12 are gonna be invitations for us to focus on um, relationship to others. Excuse me, it goes the other way, others in the middle, self and the end. So uh, as we dive a little bit more into this, um, what I'd like to sort of point out here, and this kind of falls in line with something that Joan Chittister talks about, is that it, that first relationship, this idea of God being the source of everything all the time, and this idea in rung two that God calls us beyond ourselves to be open to others, um, to something more, what it's really asking us to do is to make God the foundation of our lives. And in this way, it's sort of the first step on the journey to the degree that you are able to acknowledge that God is everything and God is everywhere all the time. With that as your foundation um, to return to over and over again, then some of the further steps along the way when we're trying to figure out how to interact with others or how to interact with ourselves, how to become our fullest selves, constantly having those two foundational rungs um, that put God at the center of everything and at the ground of our lives um, is, is the first set of relationships. And then, like I said, in, in um, steps three through seven, um, what we see is um, this idea of becoming um, open to others. And in three through seven, we get a bunch of different examples of what this looks like in real life. And what I'd like to suggest here, along with Joan, Joan Chipster, is that this set of relationships, the idea of being in relationship to others, in fact, helps us to acknowledge the ex our acceptance. So if God is our foundation, then our relationships with others help us to learn how to be accepted and also how to accept. 
Um, so it's this basic kind of sense of the world is a good place to be. I'm going to make my contribution to it because I've got this basic posture of acceptance, acceptance, a basic posture of wanting to show up and to be participate in, in the world. And then the final set of relationships, um, uh, excuse me, the final set of rungs, let um, numbers eight through 12, um, are that third set of relationships in the sense of being relation, related to yourself. And so what we see in these rungs is um, a lot of directions from Benedict about how to um, comport yourself, how to behave publicly and very externally. Um, and what I'd like to suggest there is that what that does is helps us to make a connection. It shows us that truly what's going on in our inner world is also actually affecting the outer world precisely because we are so deeply interconnected in um, as children of God. And so we've got that foundation in God, acceptance through others, and connection through um, seeing how our own showing up in the world um, is really is connect is is um, deeply relational really in relationship to others. So uh, what I'd like to do is um, suggest here that in the first set of relationships, um, it's kind of like that point on the spiritual journey when we think of the classic trajectory, trajectory of our journey. Maybe some of you are familiar with those classic purgation, illumination, and union that show up in a lot of our mystic circles or in a lot of our spiritual formation from teachers over the centuries. Um, what I think sometimes our, our teachers forget to do is to remember the conversion part. Before you're willing to do all the hard work and sacrifice of purgation, you have to have fallen in love with God. You have to have sensed that God somehow was calling you into some um, new way of life. And so what we see again is that in Benedict's ladder, um, that's really what uh, rung one and rung two are inviting us to do. As we're getting, as we discover God, maybe for the first time in our lives and we're getting to know God, um, we, we start to recognize the truth that God is uh, the source of everything all the time. And in Benedict's language, it says that a person keeps the fear of God always before one's eyes. Again, that idea that God is the foundation of all of our being and our acting. Um, I think a little bit of, you know, having had a wonderful exposure to the world of spirituality and religion in my childhood, but it wasn't until I was a high school student and I participated in tech retreats that I first opened in that kind of conversion kind of way to the love of God and to this idea that God might be so important enough and that I would actually choose God as so important that that would then make me willing to prioritize my life and organize my life in such a way that it would be ordered according to the way that God would like it to be ordered. And so we get this sense, um, you know, when I think about having made this the decision to study um, theology as a result of having these wonderful experiences as a high schooler, um, we get that's where some of our sense of being called beyond ourselves when we get our sense of life purpose, um, how it is that we're going to make a difference in the world. Um, and in Benedict's language, that's, you know, that comes up when we say a person doesn't love their own will or take pleasure in their own satisfaction, but again, has this sense that there's something more than the self um, that God is inviting us to tune into. So um, steps three through seven on Benedict's rung, um, like I said, it's interesting that the most uh, the, the biggest number of runs, there's, you know, three, four, five, six, seven. So five of them are all about dealing with others. And isn't that true that in our lives, that's a big part of the hard work of our spiritual life. And that's exactly what happens in Benedict's rule too. There's all sorts of uh, commentaries about how it is that we're going to actually have the brothers and the monks get along with each other. And so Benedict has to put a lot of guidance in about the hard work of getting along with one another. And so I like to think of these steps three, four, five, six, and seven as kind of like the perfect to path in our classic trajectory. You know, purgation is all about that inner work. We're cleaning out the old furniture and the cobby, cobwebby spaces of our heart. We're trying to um, clean out that old furniture and put light into those dark corners of our inner world. Um, and part of what we're doing then uh, in the work of purgation, and I think Benedict lays out um, some of the very practical ways that we can do this in his third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh rung, um, is to simplify our lives, to weed out and let go of all those patterns that don't really contribute to fullness of life, that limit us in some ways from being able to live into the reign of God as God would call us to live. And then finally, um, 
I think La Benedict's uh, steps are the wrong, um, eight through 12. I'm gonna pop them up here so you can see them again. Um, these are little um, little lights maybe. We start to see uh, in, in our classic language of illumination, um, what we're starting, what we experience along the journey as we mature and after we kind of get used to the sacrifice and the hard work of purgation um, and those, those inner steps, we start to see some of the benefits, we start to reap some of the fruits. And so part of what happens in our journey is that our inner life more consistently starts to reflect our outer life and vice versa. So the things that are showing up in our outer life are truly reflective of what's going on inside. So if we were cleaning up and sparkling all the furniture on the inside, it starts to show up in the way that we act in the world. And so we see Benedict emphasizing a lot of external behaviors in the rungs 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Um, so part of what we're doing is we see these sacred patterns that emerge when our inner and our outer worlds are in tune and then they reflect one another. I like to think about it, you know, in, in, in very Christian terms about these are glimpses of the reign of God and the way of life that Jesus is asking us to live in the Gospels. Um, so what I'm going to close with, I know I need to send you off into a small group, so I'm going to close with... Uh, a very practical list of questions for you. Um, and what I'm gonna invite you to do, I'm gonna actually stop the share here so you're not distracted by all this beautiful wordage here. Um, I'm gonna list just a litany of questions that I think are practical prompts based on each of these steps. And instead of trying to jot them down and, and feverishly uh, list them all, I invite you to just put your pens down, listen with your head and with your heart and with your body. And when I offer these questions, see if one speaks to you in a particular way. Um, and if you really want this list, I can share it later. So don't worry about uh, getting the whole list of questions. So rung one, if God is at the center of our lives, how do we dedicate regular time for listening to God? and learning to recognize the Holy One's voice in our prayer and in our daily life. Step number two, having learned to listen for God's guidance, how does God's vision and plans for me fit into my life purpose and my contributions to the world? Practical prompt for number three, who are the people that I ask to support me and hold me accountable along my journey? Number four, how do I face my own suffering and recognize the suffering of others? Number five, with what person or in what safe place can I do the hard work of tending to my own limitations and shadows? Number six, in what concrete ways do I set aside my own needs and preferences in order that others may also participate in the sacred spaces to do the work of healing. Number seven, in what concrete and specific ways do I allow my ego to rule my life and others? And related to that, what are the bad habits or sinful ways that I need to prune in order to prompt new life? Number eight, who are the actual people who can help me to see my limits and inspire me to make progress towards wholeness? Number nine, how can I slow down enough to know what really needs to be said and done each and every day? Number 10, in what concrete and specific ways do I need to step up or maybe step back in order to contribute to a balanced and just lifestyle for myself and for others. Number 11, how can I regularly practice real presence to others throughout my day? And number 12, what are the signs or fruits of my life that reflect to others that I am committed to God's vision and pathway of love leading to healing and wholeness? So I think, Jen, maybe what I'll do quickly um, is even just copy that text, because I know that that text is not in um, what I sent you earlier today. That's and I'll great. paste it I'll paste it into um, the piece so that people can, uh, if they want, use those specific questions as part of the uh, breakout. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Give me two seconds. I didn't quite think of that part. Give me a second. 
And Jan, I don't know, do you have the other two questions that I had posed earlier in the day in front of you at all? Um, they are in the chat. I believe everybody should have access to them now. Is that correct, Brandon? If I can unfind my unmute button. Yes, they should be in the chat, Jan. Okay. Okay, great. So those two focused questions are there. And then um, I'll also put uh, this larger list. Okay, so the two questions um, that we will send you into your small groups with are, what do you notice in your mind, heart, and body about the distinction between humility as defined and false humility as described? And what does your noticing call you to do or be today? So again, these are in the chat, so you don't have to write this down. And the second um, question is, which of the 12 rungs on Benedict's ladder of humility catch your attention? If you could put that rung into your own language, how would you phrase it? So it has some meaning for you and this inspires you towards transformation. Oh, good questions. I wish we had lots of time, but we don't. <laughs> we have 